Ladies and gentlemen, can I call us to order, please? Um, thank you so much, everybody, for, for coming here to, today. This is a, uh, uh, we have a very large crowd here. We had 50 people sign up, and I noticed we've had to put in extra chairs in the back there. And if we could just get a few more people, we, we could call it standing room only. But I, I think that uh, maybe not. But uh, anyway, I'm Graham Smith. I'm the chairperson of uh, our Natural Resources Committee here in uh, Conesty Falls. Okay. All right. Okay. And um, uh, I'm here to introduce uh, Owen Carson who has been working over the last uh, year to prepare an inventory of our natural resources. Uh, and just to give you a little bit of background, um, when our committee was formed 18 months ago, uh, we were tasked with uh, coming up with a stewardship plan to protect our natural resources here in, uh, in uh, Conesty Falls for the, for the future. And part of the uh, the uh, the stewardship plan is, or the beginning part of that, is to understand what it is that we have here, and that's why Owen has been working to inventory our resources, and that's what he's going to describe to us today. I think you'll find it very exciting. We live in a very very beautiful place and which is becoming uh, increasingly rarer as the, the world gets um, built up, and especially the east coast of the USA. Um, I should tell you that Owen is a local hero. He's lived in uh, Brevard for uh, 20 years. He went to college here in uh, at Brevard College and graduated uh, um, with a, a minor in geology. And what's your major in? I've forgotten that. Yes, no, environmental science and ecology. Okay, environmental science and ecology. So he's very, very well qualified. He is also the chairperson of the Transylvania County Natural Resources Committee. And um, I could do a shout out for them. If you ever have a spare time on a Friday morning, you should go along to their meetings because they're very, very interested and they're held downtown. Um, with that, I can't think of anything more I could say to introduce you. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to you, Owen. Owen will talk for about uh, 45 uh, minutes, give or take, and then we'll have some time for questions at the uh, at the end. So over to you, Owen. Thank you, Graham. Uh, give me just a moment. I've got a little switcheroo I've got to do here. Okay. Share screen. Just a moment. Uh, of course. Did it? I did it. Sorry. I'm gonna make make sure I'm sharing it. Awesome. Great. Well, I think everyone online can now see my screen and um, I hope that everyone can see this up here well. I hope everyone can hear me and I will try my best to use the microphone. I I move around a lot. Um, so I, and I will be stepping aside to talk about slides and point at maps and things like that. So, um, but first off, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, Graham Smith for the introduction. As he said, my name's Owen Carson. Um, 
and I live here in Brevard. I have since 2004, went to college here, graduated with those degrees and, and the minors that he described and um, never left. I love it here. It's, it's a wonderful place to be. There's a lot to see, a lot to experience. Um, I'm building a family now. My wife, who I met at Brevard College, is a teach, teacher at Rosman High School, and we're raising nine-year-old twins. And so um, they're boy, girl, and, uh, and just awesome human beings. So um, I'm, I'm really excited to be up here. I also do represent uh, the Transylvania Natural Resources Council. I'm the chairperson, as Graham said. Quick pitch on us. We're just an advisory board for the county commissioners. We help them make informed decisions about um, policy and procedure that, as it relates to our natural resources. And so we meet as a group um, once a month, second Friday, nine o'clock to 11 o'clock in the morning. We take a hiatus for the summer, which is from now until August, and we'll start back up in August. But I invite everyone here to, to, to join our meetings, come and hear uh, you know, what we like to speak about. We have programs, invite speakers and guests to come in and talk about their expertise, things like the fish of Transylvania County. Um, we had people talk about uh, stormwater and erosion control on steep slopes in the mountains. We've had um, people talk about from the NC Audubon come and talk about birding. So lots of interesting things. I'm sure you guys have programs up here too, but you're all welcome as Transylvania County members and even folks who don't live here most of the year, please come join us for one of our meetings. We'd love it. So with that, slide forward here. Great. So just a couple acknowledgements. Um, I'd like to thank first the, the Natural Resources Stewardship Council um, for giving us this work, uh, for uh, giving us the opportunity to explore uh, the biodiversity here and build an inventory from which you can plan um, for helping me with getting around Conesty and the various uh, areas of and natural areas you guys have um, interspersed throughout your community. And just for providing um, uh, your expertise and, and insights, there are some um, past uh, natural resource professionals on the council. And so it was great to be able to um, coordinate with them as we move through our inventory process. Um, I'd like to personally thank Graham Smith, uh, the chairperson for the NRSC, the leader, the coordinator, a great communicator, and um, just really supportive. So um, thank you, Graham. Penny Longhurst, I'm not sure if she's here today. I don't see her in, in, in the crowd. There she is. Um, fellow botanist and, um, you know, just has a wealth of knowledge about the property, gave me some good insight about um, where to find the little bits of um, heterogeneity and a little interesting places on the property, and also gave me some great information about rare or uncommon species that she'd seen. Um, very good. Uh, for the residents of Conesty Falls, for you here who are interested in this project and interested in, and, and invested in this community, thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge you and your commitment for upholding the stewardship um, committee here, uh, because I think what they are planning and what y'all have got here is, is really amazing. So thank you. Um, and last, I, I want to um, acknowledge and recognize the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. I do this in most of my talks, uh, especially in this part of the world. Um, this land, and I have a couple slides or a slide about the kind of the, a brief history of this property here. But, you know, this land, all this land was once owned by or lived on, not even owned necessarily in the sense, but lived on, occupied, um, cultivated, nourished by the indigenous peoples. And so, you know, we're here today on with land that we now own um it's it's important to recognize the eastern band of cherokee indians um whenever i do work you know in this part of the world so quick outline um i'll provide some historical context uh for the property talk about the purpose here graham covered most of it i'll kind of glaze through that slide talk about our process you know how we gather data here um the different pathways we took to uh, both from a desktop perspective, gathering information all the way to um, analyzing it, modeling it, and then uh, going out in the field and spending lots and lots of hours ground truthing what we thought we might find. Um, I've, I'll share with you our findings and then um, just a, some recommendations, you know, that that from our professional perspective, um, some 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 things that could help continue this effort uh, towards uh, ultimately stewarding the natural resources y'all have here. So a bit of a historical context, um, pre-settlement, Conesty is an adaptation of the Canasta 
a Cherokee, a, a small tribe of of the Cherokee that occupied this part of the world. They lived in upstate South Carolina, um, and essentially, you know, they they dwelled on the escarpment. And so those people, you know, lived here for for thousands of years, um, living off the land, sustainably with it, um, engaging with it, growing, managing the land uh, through through their own indigenous practices. So pre-settlement, the the Canasta tribe, Conesty. Um, 1700s, we had Walt, what, what's known as Walton's War, um, and there's a really interesting book on the history of this part of the world um, that dives into this. I'm going to just glaze surface level, but essentially Georgia and North Carolina were fighting over this part of the world. Uh, this was it's called Buncombe County at the time, and um, Walton County down there in Georgia, there was a, there was a struggle over this part of the world. Um, and uh, ultimately Georgia backed off and now we're in Transylvania County today. Um, so from the 1700s on, it was very small settlement, uh, you know, rural community, um, you know, uh, mountain living, mountain living um, with settlements. It's, it's tough to live up here and to eke out a living, but um, you know, there, there was, Things were growing in the 1880s. Um, the uh, railway, Carolina Knoxville um, Railway, uh, started work. Um, they started grading in a railroad grade that would help move things across the escarpment um, and abandon it. And so we see some of those remnants on the property here today. I'll show you a slide that shows the old railroad grade above the Carson Creek Gorge. Um, so railroad abandoned. And then, you know, the, the little community of Reba was, was aggregated here. Um, I have some last names on the slide, some common last names you recognize from around here, but those were the families that settled and, and lived in this little community of Reba. It's pictures of the schoolhouse. Um, there's a picture of the old mill on Conesty Falls. Uh, it was a grist mill and it was actually kind of uncommon because the water wheel is, is capturing the energy low down on the falls. And so it's, it's hung below the, the mill operation, which is pretty uncommon, but um, there's an interesting picture there of some people fancily dressed up. You know, it's kind of like, there's definitely modern day versions of this picture uh, out there. Um, and then fast forward to the 1970s when land uh, was purchased, a big chunk of land was purchased and the, um, the community of Conesty Falls was first began. And, and now here we are today, uh, you know, with this beautiful property, um, these really nice patches of natural areas, uh, areas for human use, roadways, impoundments, streams, all these really, really interesting natural and anthropogenic features combined here on this property. And so we have a lot of interesting habitat here uh, based on the land use over time. So the purpose of this study, essentially it's for, it's a, it's for planning purposes. I don't want, I'm not trying to, uh, to um, simplify it too much, but when when we when Equinox works with clients to engage in stewardship planning, oftentimes there is an idea of of what people where people want to be, but we try to help guide them and start from you know a, a, a base point. So knowing what you've got really helps you form a plan for stewarding what you've got. And so when when we were contacted by the stewardship council. Um, you know, we had a lot of back and forth conversation and, you know, it was clear to us that in order for them to effectively develop a long-term stewardship plan to protect the resources here, they needed to know exactly what resources they had. Um, people have a really good idea. Well, a lot of you collective individuals out there have seen countless wildlife, streams, rock outcroppings, waterfalls, but there really wasn't a comprehensive document describing it all. There had been some, some previous work with biologists from the state in and around the area. And so little pieces of information related to Conesty were there, but really, you know, this effort is, you know, to consolidate that information and develop a baseline inventory that identifies and describes the natural resources that Conesty has. So in order to segue into a stewardship plan that focuses on, you know, the most important elements that are decided upon by the stewardship committee. So pretty simple purpose. I'll talk about our process today, um, how we approached tackling 2,000 plus acres of natural area to assess. Um, you know, we are, we, we don't have a horde of 50 biologists on our squad. It's me and a wildlife biologist. And so, you know, 
um, that's a lot of acreage. And so we like to approach it, take a methodical approach by looking at um, gathering data on the property, analyzing that using geospatial programs. And so looking at like mapping programs and, and land geography programs. And then once we have a good idea and a good sense of of our of the layout of the land, we form our approach and hit the field for field assessment. Um, so I'll describe a little bit more about that process, the data gathering here. Um, first off, like I said, there is a fair bit of information already here um, existing bits and pieces, uh, you know, so there, there is um, geospatial data, geographic data. If anyone's ever used the tax parcel website, you know, that's the type of data at base that we start with. Um, but we have our fingertips and we have access to a little bit deeper and more specific information. So when we build our geospatial maps and we use information from state and national databases, local databases, we pull in information regarding geology, hydrology, we parse through um, information that is collected by the state that uh, is, is related to land surface. And so then we take all that um, and, and begin to work it together. We also reach out to um, different organizations like the Natural Heritage Program or the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. And we ask them to share some data that they might not make publicly available due to uh, sensitive species or sensitive habitats. And so we, we as assessors want to understand where that habitat is in relation to Conestee Falls so that we can project and predict if the property here has those similar types of habitats. If it does, then we know we can drill down and look for those specific species. And so it's a methodical approach using all these different layers. Um, we also get these publicly available Natural Heritage Program reports um, if, if, and if there are, uh, so to back up briefly, the natural heritage program tracks rare species throughout the state. They also develop county inventories that describe the best and most natural areas in, in the state or in the county. Those may or may not be under a protection like forest service land or a conservation easement. They could be on someone's private property, but, um, they maintain these inventories and they send out biologists infrequently. They used to have like a recurring cycle, but it's, their funding has gone down. Um, so if you want to, uh, if you want to tr fund biology, bi biological research in the state, look to the natural heritage program. Um, but back in 2008, Transvenic County was inventoried. And so the biologist from the state, who is a, a friend of mine, um, developed a report that part of which covered some of Conestee Falls in the very north western portion in the Carson Creek Gorge. It also helped described other pieces of land around the the uh, natural elements that made them significant. And so I, I was able to obtain those reports, read through them, and again, project how that information might apply to Conesty and, and see if I could find some of these interesting things that their biologists have found elsewhere. It also allows me to know when I don't need to look further. And that's important because, you know, a big thing is we don't want to be redundant. We don't want to repeat anyone's information. And so um, there was a very specific descriptions on the Carson Creek Gorge and, um, it, it, you know, included in that report, very comprehensive. The biologist spent most of his time down in that gorge documenting. And so me as a professional, I'm going to default to his information, verify it in the field, but not spend my time looking at the places where he didn't go you know, so we can get a better sense of the full picture of Conesty. This is an example. Uh, this map here is an example of like one of the front pages of a natural area from the Transylvania County inventory. It was done in 2008. The maps reflect that it's a little dated, but, um, you know, you can clearly see portions of Conesty Falls via the lakes, um, and then you can see that black outlined area. So that's known as the Jim Rains Mountain Conesty Falls Natural Area. So pretty cool. You guys actually do have your name in this state report. Um, but you can also see that the area um, pertaining to Conesty Falls proper is really just the Batson Creek and Carson Creek Gorges as it fronts 276 up there. So the majority of it is connected to what is Northwest uh, on of Jim Rains Mountain. There are some interesting natural communities down there, some actually some habitats that don't occur on Conesty Falls, but some information in that report really helped inform 
what I might find here. And so I just wanted to show you an example. Um, and I have a map later that will show you in context the rest of these natural areas as they surround Conesty Falls. And you'll, you'll get a good sense of just how well situated this place is in a natural landscape. Something that was also really, really uh, an, an excellent part of this project was the engagement of the community here. So professional biologists, you know, we have a contract, we have hours, and we have a budget. And so I try to be as efficient as I can with my time. I, I saw this property in every single season. I saw it in every single month. Um, but I wasn't here for, uh, you know, 10 hours a day or five days a row in a row. I was, you know, taking pot shots, trying to figure out, you know, when the phenology of a plant or an animal might sync up with my field work. So to have the best chance of seeing it when it was above ground or finding it out and about. And so we thought it was a great idea to engage the community here through a program called iNaturalist. Um, I have a slide at the end, and I also will click on this link here, hopefully it works, and show you what it looks like. But really, I mean, some of y'all may have seen this flyer, and some of you in here may, uh, raise your hand if you, if you joined iNaturalist and if you contributed any records. Okay, so awesome, great. And you can see here, there are 24 people active, including myself, active biologists, citizen scientists, looking around Conesty Falls, taking pictures of things they see, and reporting them to this to this page. And so what we have created, essentially, we've encouraged the community con to connect continuously with the environment. We have, we are generating data that is supplemental to mine, you know, so um, things that when people are taking uh, one hour, you know, quarter mile walks, which botanists and other people who are really interested in natural things that we have a tendency to do that, very slow walks, but you know me, I'm go I'm going. I'm trying to get through places, and so we're we're allowing the web of citizen scientists in Conesty to capture data and submit it, and then I and other folks, including the iNaturalist community, will curate that data. So validating, yes, this is what you saw. I agree with this, or no, I think this is this species. But the community of iNaturalist um, helps to validate those records and then puts them all in one place and essentially creates a living list of the organisms that people have seen on Conesty. One, the one thing that's challenging is uploading records from the format from my report into the iNaturalist. So all the things that I observed and recorded in the report, you know, what I was thinking, I mean, this is going to be challenging to organize this data and get it in the right format to put it back into that um, and back into iNaturalist. However, I was pleasantly surprised to find that a lot of the things that I documented, and plus many more things like fungi and things that I, you know that I was not spending too much time looking at, overwhelming, overwhelmingly documented by citizen scientists out out in out and about in Conesty. So, I thought that was really really nice to to know that um, it made my job a little bit easier uh, to not have to reformat all this data and feed it back into the program. I'm going to click on this real quick. So you can see, but this is what this looks like. It shows some stats up here, how many observations, how many species are represented in those observations, who are the people that, um, you know, collected the data. This Rebe person, are you in here? Ah, that's a bummer. Huh? It says stop. It is oh, thank you. Reshare that screen. Okay. Cool. Thank you. So, you know, it, it shows who's doing what, what's been seen. It gives you kind of a rundown of what's been observed the most. And then there's also, you know, recently observed species. There's a, a map that shows you where these observations were made within the Conesty Falls property. And the data is restricted to within the confines of the perimeter of Conesty Falls. And so people from, you know, outside you know, unless you saw it in here, it's not like outside data is going to make it into here. So this is actually a really good collected list. And you can almost see, you can see like trail pathways, like someone, someone had a nice walk here and, and, you know, up the gorge and collected a lot of data on that walk, you know, and contributed it to the website. And now we have a record of it. Um, the great thing is too, we can pull these records off. And so if the stewardship committee ever needs to manage, maintain, 
uh, change, develop some sort of document, they can pull it off of there easily and and into their into their data or into their report as needed. So this is a really great uh, tool, and I think it's worked exceptionally well. Here's some pictures of some of the most recent observations, as you can see. Um, and I'll talk about this guy right here, this green salamander, uh, but that was very exciting to see posted on the iNaturalist page because it's a species um, that is very rare in this area. It's actually state endangered. Um, it has very niche habitat requirements and it's very hard to find. You can find them in the rocks that they overwinter in between uh, November and essentially April. And then they leave those rocks go up into the trees and don't come back down until fall. And so we don't know much about what they're doing up there. And there's also, there are records all around Conistee Falls. And we noted, as did the biologists, that there's great habitat in here, but we hadn't been able to find one. This is a great way that shows that in this iNaturalist program, someone happened to see this in their driveway, which is, you know, um, and people in DuPont see them on their houses sometimes or, or, or you know, screens and things like that. So this is a great way to capture data when I couldn't be there, you know, looking in the crevices for the rocks. And so that, that to me was really awesome to see that. I'm gonna stop sharing this screen, share. Back to the presentation. Boom, all right, got it down. I'll talk a little bit more about kind of the results at the end, but I just, I think it's, it's important to, to stress the fact that this iNaturalist program is a great way to get continued data, continued engagement, um, and, con and just build this living list uh, that'll be useful for all sorts of people. I'll talk a little bit later about maybe the cutting edge, the, the other side of the sword. You know, there are some nefarious uses of iNaturalist, people looking for records of plants that they want in their yard and then going out and seeking them based on what people, other people are reporting. Um, there, there were discussions about that. And I think that's a, I'll, I'll touch back based on that in my recommendation section later, but um, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And I think that's all that needs to be said right now. Um, let's see. So we've collected a bunch of data. What do we do with it? So some of that data, like the stuff I talked about on the tax parcel website, all that's pretty straightforward, you know, but but there are some data that we have our hands on and and some pro computer processes that we, you know, uh, have learned over time in order to give us a, a different perspective of Conesty and other landscapes and really helps us drill down on where we might want to look for some of the rarest species that have the most specific habitat requirements. And this picture you see here, is a it is a digital elevation model of data that was collected by the state by flying a plane over and shooting lasers down at the ground and those lasers penetrate everything and then bounce back we can then get access to that data and start to dig through it because cer cer the certain parts of the laser hit the top of the tree and go up C certain hit the ground and go up and certain ones, uh, you know, hit other things in between, like the footprint of a building. And so you can take this data and start to process it to remove noise, if you will. So this image here is a picture of the ground surface in the Carson Creek Gorge. You can see the railroad grade here, you know, which shows up very specifically, um, as do most road beds. You can see across the way the other road beds that have been cut in over time. Um, you can see how uh, heterogeneous the surface is compared to the smooth hilltops up here. And so what this picture tells me with my experience and through ground truthing is that there are a lot of really large boulder cliff-like environments coming down the slopes into Carson Creek Gorge. And that Carson Creek itself has this wild pattern of undulation and a really wide floodplain. And when you get down there in there, if, if anyone's ever been out and seen the bottom of Carson Creek, you can see, you can kind of, you can start to relate, like if there's huge boulders in the creek, the stream divides. It's not just like you're, it's not the French broad. It's not one stream. It's, it's, it's uh, multi-threaded and it's influenced by the rocks. And so this picture here um, 
really just illustrates one of the data layers that we use and use pretty heavily to help guide field work. So in this particular case, Carson Creek Gorge stands out. That's awesome. But the biologist from the state spent most of his time in there. So the, the montane cliffs and the big, you know, the big rock cliffs and rock outcrops that he was describing in his report are validated by this data here. So I don't need to crawl around through all of that to know that there's truth in that statement. But I did go in there to try and ve verify whether or not there was good green salamander habitat. So it's just an example of how we use this data and how we can parse it to got to drive our field work. Uh, we also, so kind of an, another thing, this is more about like the shape of the land and predicting water features. But um, in this part of the world, we're in the headwaters. We, you know, this, this is the top of the mountain. Streams begin just off the ridge top and they flow down into their, into their respective tributaries. So what we've found in, in, in the past decade through looking at um, doing bug studies and, and high elevation stream studies is that these environments are home to some pretty interesting, rare, uncommon creatures, both salamanders, but mostly bugs that live in the water, benthic macroinvertebrates. They spend part of their time as a water bug and part of their time flying around um, pollinating, reproducing, or feeding many of the birds, the songbirds that live in our forests. So um, we have been using recently uh, this digital elevation model to look at and predict where headwater wetlands might occur. Those are even more unique environments, especially in this part of the Southern Appalachians. That's sometimes where you get montane bogs. So there, there are headwater bog situations. There are floodplain bogs. You know, this ground surface really shows and depicts the headwater nature of these streams. So just off the ridge here, you know, you can see the faint, it's fading into this, but you can see the faint, the faint outline of a channel and it becomes more and more defined as it flows downstream to finally it's really well defined in its main channel. But as you, as you go up, you can see there's these little pockets here, pockets, pockets at the top. These represent important headwater seepage areas and areas that, that I, as a biologist, want to go look in season, see if I can find rare plants that might occur there, rare animals that might occur there. Uh, those, those headwater seeps are important environment for wildlife. So again, this type of information, predictive mapping, we found it's, a, it's about 75% accurate at predicting montane wetlands. And so we use that, you know, on a desktop perspective to help program and drive our field work. So we looked at a lot of maps um, and I realized there's one picture here that is inaccurate. Uh, that plant there is, is not here at Conacy. That's, that's a, from a different place, but don't mind me. So our field assessment. So we take this information, we look at the past inventory data. We look at the narratives from the biologists reports. We look at our computerized modeling data. Um, and then we look at like aerial imagery to see, you know, is this an evergreen forest? Is this a deciduous forest? You know, and, and so all of that is to try and help guide where to look and when to look. So it drills down towards our botanical inventory. So what, what we have, what we did is we did not try to produce an exhaustive flora of Conacy Falls. That is a project that would be well-suited for a Brevard College student at some point. Um, but those types of flora are extremely intensive. And because of that, they're best done when partnered with uh, an academic organization. They can provide the capacity for the right price. Um, and also you get you know kids experienced in developing like a true flora for a site. But ours was really to try and um, see as many habitats as we possibly could and see those habitats throughout the seasons so that we could capture the best idea of the flora that we saw changing over the seasons. And so we, we did just that. Um, and we used trails here in Conesty to guide our field work into remote areas and then did a lot of off-trail work, hiking on slopes, trying to get good cross sections um, through the different habitats that we found here. And this is not um, a this is not a ding. 
Conestee Falls and this part of the world actually, while we have incredible plant diversity here, the, the diversity of ecosystems um, sometimes, depending on the landscape you're in, can be relatively homogenous. And so it's not to say that Conestee Falls is bland or doesn't have any sort of diversity. It does. It has a lot of diversity. But you get a lot of the very common Southern Appalachian forest types here um, and fewer of the more uncommon types. So we have a lot of um, acidity here. So compared to places where there's limestone in the geology, where there's this, the pH of the soils is much higher and, and therefore supports much higher plant diversity. We have a paucity of, of lime here. We're, we're more in the acidic side. So we could range between, you know, two and a half and at the most extreme and around, you know, six um, in our pH, which functionally limits the types of communities and types of species diversity that we normally see. So um, it, that's not to say that some really incredible places and habitats form over acidic soils, but the vast majority of conesty in the natural areas and even in the, the lots that, you know, are not developed, um, but were included in this inventory, there's a lot of what is described as montane oak hickory forest acidic subtype. And that sounds bland and boring, but, but, um, there is, there are large, vast expanses of this forest type, and it's really important for a lot of our local Appalachian wildlife. And so they're not blase or anything like that, but there's not the spread of ecosystems on this particular property that you might see, um, you know, over in uh, areas near the balsams or in the craggies or other places like that. So we just, we have a more uniform geology here, and it is produces predictable ty forest types. Again, interesting stuff in there, but um, yeah. So as we move through these forest types, uh, we're trying not to spend too much time in one and trying to get a good transect to see where those forest types change between one and the other, how the species composition changes, and then we can, we can better build our inventory. Um, one last thing to say about the botanical search here. So, the data that we obtain from the state natural heritage program, one of the layers is we look at known rare species locations within a mile or two miles proximity of the property. And when I look at that list, I immediately start thinking, okay, these have very specific habitat that likely isn't on Conestee Falls, or these have specific habitat that definitely is on Conestee Falls. And so start to prioritize my own work once you figure out the suite of species that of rare species that could occur here in Conestee, you've also got to apply the filter of time. So a lot of plants stay below the ground most of the time. Some of them are really easy to identify when they're in flower and very difficult to distinguish between species when they're not in flower. So when I'm looking and prioritizing rare species searches, I'm also adding the time filter and so to try to get out at the right time of year to find those plants. And it actually benefited um, us two specific times where, you know, looking for a specific species of orchid or knowing that a specific species of orchid could occur in these habitats and in part, portions of the forest that had been disturbed or manipulated, um, we ar ar arrived at a population of orchid that has not been documented on the property and is uncommon. So it, it is validating when you have those experiences, when you do a lot of planning, and then you go to the place where you think it is and it's there. So um, that didn't happen. And there's a picture of that one species, this orchid here, it's Cleostesiopsis. It's the Appalachian spreading pagonia. And it occurs in acidic oak hickory forests that, uh, that see regular disturbance. And so this species is fire adapted and disturbance adapted. One of the biggest disturbances without the influence of man uh, on this ecosystem would be wildfire. And so in places where you have um, disturbance conditions, this was not a wildfire. We don't, there haven't been any wildfires in the community in a while. This was actually in a place where someone had cleared timber to prep a lot and then, and then walked away. And so they increased the light down into the forest and it, it caused this orchid to come up because it had been just 
in dormancy, essentially, or living in the shade for years. So a disturbance like tree clearing, which mimics something like wildfire, benefits this species. So only in this one spot did we find it. Actually, sorry, we found it in two different spots with similar disturbance patterns. It indicates to me that um, there probably are a lot more of these in the forests around here. Um, so, and you know, they, and if those forests become disturbed, there's a good chance that they could pop back up. So I got a little off on a tangent on that species because it's very charismatic, but um, the field assessment uh, portion, we moved from kind of our standard botanical inventory also into delineating the natural communities. Um, a natural community is at base, it's a uh, repetitive, assemblage of plants, animals, fungi, and soils that can be classified throughout the state. And so um, natural areas in North Carolina are classified and or delineated into, into natural communities. And so one of the biggest and most important aspects of our work was to try and classify natural communities within Conestes natural areas, because certain of those communities are at risk. And so knowing what you've got what's at risk can really help the stewardship committee figure out what do we need to do to best protect this forest type moving into the future. Some of them don't need much management, you know, some of them need active management. And I'll talk a little bit more about those ecosystems, but, um, you know, we, we use our uh, modeling, our computer modeling to get out into those headwater systems. Is there a headwater wetland there? Is it a bog, you know? And a lot of the times we found, yes, there are neat headwater wetlands here. There is one bog here and probably maybe we're likely more bogs, um, but there is one remnant bog here. And also we use that information, the geospatial information specifically here to try and hunt down rock outcroppings, boulder outcroppings like the one you see in the picture. These are bedrock projections dry, so not wet, which is atypical for salamanders, but dry outcroppings, lateral crevices, that's ideal habitat for green salamanders. And so we used our computer modeling to literally, I mean, you can go out and find boulders that are about the size of this podium. They show up on the, on the documentation. So, you know, my, my role at certain times of the year, like around April or again in September, October, when they're coming back down the crevices is to survey those areas where I see boulders on the screen, validate that they are there, and then see if they are appropriate for green salamanders. We did that a bunch, found a bunch of boulders. Uh, there's a picture in the former slideshow of me and a couple other committee members looking into crevices with a flashlight. Never found them. Of course, they show up on a driveway. So um, again, you know, the, the, using the computer information to drive our field work, which makes it most efficient and helps us really try and capture those rare and uncommon species w when they occur there. So um, the delineation of natural communities also, well, put it this way, it's not a hard line. My, the map that I will show you shows a line delineating those boundaries. It's very it's nuanced, it's an ecotone. So it's not, you're not, very rarely are you standing in one natural community and then standing in another. There's a gradient between them. And so, you know, all of that is to say that there is some subjectivity involved with drawing these, those community boundaries. However, when you get into very specific habitats like bogs, you really can step from one down into the other and be in a completely new environment. So there is, value um, for finding those ecotones and for getting in those ones that are very stark because the, the, those can give you a great um, reference example between you know upland and wetland or pine forest and deciduous forest you know so um, again delineating out those communities we map them and then we include them uh, with their state ranking uh, in this report so that we understand okay how much forest type do we have? What type is it? And how many of our acres are represented or represent important or uh, rare or imperiled forest types? That again can help make a stewardship decision. We also um, conducted wildlife habitat assessments. So these were both, um, well, these were kind of multi-parted. 
I invited our wildlife biologist out into the field with us. And he identified from a desktop perspective, you know, what species that were uncommon, because we all know what we have here, right? The common things that people see on the road, swerve around on the road, you know, see climbing trees, bears, we have turkey, we have foxes, bobcats, things like that. They're great to see on cameras. But what we're also looking for is those uncommon species in North Carolina that are a little more clandestine, a little more secretive. Um, things like green salamander, we've already talked about that, but also um, species like spotted skunk, uh, which is a, a species of skunk that only occurs in the uh, southern Appalachian, uh, sorry, it's a southern and central Appalachian endemic. It's pretty uncommon, it's nocturnal. Um, and we tried really hard to catch that thing on camera and we could not. They like bananas. We spread a lot of banana around in front of cameras and left them out in the woods in places where our biologists thought would be a great place to catch them. Nothing. Also looking for things like uh, other rare clandestine species. We put some cameras down in Carson Creek Gorge to try and capture mink, you know, or fisher species of um, weasels. You know, they're historically uh, were densely occupied, occupied this area. And I suspect that it's a good habitat down in Carson Creek, but I think that the relationship between the impoundments and what has happened downstream has probably degraded the fishery. And so where a mink would once have plenty of food to eat, there may not be enough. So, I mean, we caught a lot of raccoons on camera, washing their food in the creek and, you know, running up and down, um, but no mink. But those are the types of things we look for when we place these um, baited game camera traps. We also do opportunistic searches for uh, for insects, terrestrial insects, benthic macroinvertebrates, so water insects. Um, we're looking for uh, herpetiles, so um, reptiles, amphibians, anything we come across. I'm always flipping logs and putting them back. I'm always looking into crevices um, for, for whatever I might find there. So, you know, those types of opportunistic searches um, for organisms. Um, and then, again, we... Well, this one says plants, but we prioritize searches for, um, you know, rare wildlife as described. So we can try to catch them at the right time of year or in the right uh, geographic or physical location. And so, you know, sometimes our cameras are very specifically placed to try and catch one species. Um, if someone here can, can invent a, a camera that can capture a green salamander, you'll make some money. Uh, we don't have that yet. Um, but it's again, a, a, you know, some, a smattering of some images um, here, you know, some just some little field finds and plenty more. I mean, I, you know, the whole slideshow before showed the bear here. I saw, I think I saw a picture of a fox. I don't have a picture of a deer in here. You're welcome. Um, so ultimately, you know, we, we spent, like I said, time on the ground every single month starting and actually I think I came out here first in December of 2021, but really started ramping up field work in spring of 2022 and stayed throughout, came uh, came out to different places, went out and set, some days it was just setting game cameras and some days it was coming out to grab them. Um, other days it was a full eight hour day in the field, digging back into those far recesses of the property, especially on the Southern side of the property where it starts to, to really drop off the mountain. Um, so all this field work, you know, all this desktop analysis, all of the field observations compiled into a final document, a natural resource inventory. And, and really what we found is that on, in a nutshell, the Conacy is, is, has some great landscape scale conservation values. It is directly connected. I mean, part of it's contained with, or part of a natural area covers Conacy Falls, but it's directly connected to several other distinct and important ecological natural areas. There are patches of good quality uh, biodiversity and wildlife habitat here. That is a little bit impinged by the roads and the other infrastructure that we have in here. So it's a it's a balance in this community. You know, you, we live where the wildlife do and they live where we do. And so um, I think there's some, there are really good patches and, and corridors for connectivity. There are also places that I wouldn't call them barren, but there are places where I would not see wildlife very often. And so an interesting juxtaposition in the community here. And then there's uh, the community, Conacy Falls in this general area, especially further south from Conacy Falls, 
um, maps as moderately resilient to most resilient in terms of climate change. And, and what that just means is that the forest integrity, the temperature regimes here, um, this part of the world is the place to be to, uh, to be buffered from the effects of climate change. We are in a unique position here. I think we're also seeing uh, people realize that and move up here more because you know we we stay more moderated in our in our uh, climate here, uh, and so you know we have pretty good resiliency against climate change up here in these mountains. A lot of unique topographical features I showed you: uh, cliffs, boulder fields, bedrock outcroppings, dry, wet. There's over 22 miles of streams in Conesey, which is pretty amazing. Um, it is. 3,000 acres, but 22 miles of streams is an impressive figure. I don't even want to do the back math to get it into, it's like 119,000 linear feet of stream or something like that. Um, but, you know, it starts with headwater streams and seepages, headwater bogs, um, and drives all the way down into the main stem of Carson Creek, which is the biggest uh, stream that we have on the property here. Um, there are five or six distinctive community types here. Um, one of which is very rare. There's a Southern Appalachian bog here, um, which is a, a habitat that traditionally supported species like pitcher plants, um, uncommon species associated with uh, those wet habitats, bogs in the mountains, especially, especially in this part of the world, interestingly enough, support a lot of disjunct coastal plain species. So at some point in time, plant species from the coastal plain made it here and stayed here and find those favorable coastal plain like environments in these tiny little mountain bogs. And so the, even though these places are vastly gone, the bogs, unfortunately people have ditched them and drained them um, to make land usable. Um, you know, these little bastions of hope, including the one that's here in Conesty, you know, represent like really important uh, uh, ecological zones and that need to be protected. And so I, I think um, it sounded like the stewardship committee is, you know, well aware of that fact. And I think there's a good gravity towards making sure that bog here is protected. Um, we also did find rare plants and rare animals, some of which you've seen the rare animals. Um, I've chosen after discussions with other clients on recent projects where we did identify sensitive species, um, rare species, plants specifically that are very desirable for one reason or another, medicinal, landscape, some people just like to collect rare things and that's just their, their thing. Um, we've chosen in recent months to try and back off providing specific information to the public on those plants um, because unfortunately we do find sometimes there's a direct correlation with the knowledge of a plant and then the disappearance of that plant. And so um, I'll talk about that in, in the next section, recommendations, a little bit, how, how to prevent that, how to create a culture of awareness around that. Um, but ultimately, it's up to the citizens of Conesey Falls who see this data, who see these plants, to love them in the place that they're in and leave them in the place that they're in. I think that's, that's really important. So some maps here. This, this, this is good. I, I told you I'd show you a conservation context map. Well, this map gives you an overview. This, the squiggly spaghetti in there, that's all of the lines of Conesty Falls POA owned uh, property. So essentially you can see Conesty in there, you can see the lakes, but you can also see that it's pretty well surrounded or at least closely connected to, if not barely disconnected from multiple natural areas that have ratings from exceptional all the way down to moderate. And so, you know, I think it's it's important to point out the fact that where your community is located is in a hot spot of um, of natural biodiversity, and people know it. You know this this people come here a lot. Maybe a lot of you have come here because of the biodiversity and made your home here. But this map really illustrates the context and the connectivity that this landscape has to those surrounding landscapes. And it's a good underlying feature to just say at base. Conesty Falls is important because it's it's connected to and provides flow between these other protected and important landscapes. This map here is a is a layer that's generated by the Natural Heritage Program. Um, we put it onto all of our maps to give our clients ideas of um, how their property or community might operate 
in terms of biodiversity and wildlife habitat. I think this map is really illustrative of the fact that there is a lot of human influence in this landscape. So if you look just to the south, you see full green, uh, 9, 10 maximum relative conservation value. But quickly, you, you jump north into the southern portions of Conesty, and you know that's where there are houses. That's where there are roads. Those don't even get rankings. You know? And so those types of anthropogenic features are lost to the model, and it only considers natural landscapes you will see that some of the highest rated areas on the property run parallel with the water courses here. So those 22 miles of streams, they rank really high on importance for biodiversity and wildlife habitat. So this map, although it tells me there, there is some disconnection because of all the infrastructure here, because of what has happened to the land over time, um, there still are really important uh, aspects of the property that are valuable and worthy of stewarding. Again, this is that site resiliency map that I described. This just kind of shows, it's an overlay and it shows the resiliency of a landscape to climate change. Unfortunately, uh, you know, roads, built areas don't receive a rating. They're actually shown as developed, but you can see the Southern portions of Conesty have really good uh, connectivity to those resilient landscapes. And so I think it indicates that, you know, the, the greater community does have good to moderate resiliency for climate change. This is a good map of the water resources. Um, again, this, this is showing the water courses that were verified and validated. Um, it's also showing the watersheds that the property drains to. You've got, you know, Cherryfield Creek, far, far, far western portions of the property drain towards the Ch Cherryfield Creek. Um, probably the vast majority of it drains it's either split between draining northward or southward um, into Carson Creek or into the East Fork Creek. And so, you know, this just illustrates the fact that Conesty has a lot of headwater resources here and they flow off of the property and onto important landscapes. So um, stewarding the quality of the water here uh, and being sentient of how you develop in this, in this landscape has implications offsite too. A um, couple of pictures of a smattering of just kind of the water resources. We got some sphagnum moss from the bog. Um, this interesting little cased caddis fly. You see it's a cool stone casing built by these underwater bugs. These headwater streams that are kind of sand bed. A lot of um, dragonfly activity in there. Lots of really interesting habitat. And of course, these mayfly larvae that are common under rocks that we flip in the streams. They're really important for when they, for, um, stream dwelling organisms and predators, but also important for songbirds in the forests when they hatch. Natural features map, this one shows the natural communities that were delineated for the property. So again, lots of montane oak hickory forests, the brown, um, lots of acidic cove forest, which is a rhododendron based environment lining the creeks. But then at some of your top, your top, your ridge tops, um, there's chestnut oak dominated forests. There's also some neat pine oak dominated forests. Those are um, becoming increasingly uncommon and also have the potential to harbor some interesting species. And so those have a little bit higher conservation rank. And then you have this, the, the bog is really difficult to see, but it's right down here, right down here. Is it Tala Court, I think is the name of the, it was the road. I can't remember, T-A-L-A -A maybe, Tala. Um, but there's a, there's a neat area open right there. Um, visible right from the side of the road. Um, worth checking out. Please don't walk in the bog. Um, some examples: Montana oak hickory forest has lots of different view, lots of different looks. It has a closed canopy look. Um, this image on the, the large image on the left, you know, over sloping forest. This one's leading into a draw. There's some flats dominated by ferns. You also have these kind of disturbed areas, which is where we might find things like that orchid. Um, Rocky areas, I kind of want to give a smattering of those. You had some really interesting dry rock outcrops. You had some very interesting wet bedrock outcrops with seepages and small niche plant communities and moss communities, good crevice habitat for animals. Headwater streams, tons of them here. They can look pretty different to these like really wet monkey seepages down here, barely flowing to, you know, nice little uh, step pool systems. Again, lots of sand in the stream, which indicates to me that, you know, over time, the sandy soils have moved downstream. But um, this is a good example of those open areas. Uh, so those disturbed oak hickory forests, see how bright it is in there. 
there's a different plant community, and that's where we find these species that are more adapted to higher light environments. Um, upland areas with large pines, uh, oak heath type habitats, really dense mountain laurel, those are great wildlife habitat. Um, and also in these pine oak forests, uh, you find some interesting plants that are they're very hard to, easy to detect, very hard to find physically. Um, so just some cool little elements there. And then um, this is a findings page that shows kind of our, I, I, I scrolled through it already and nothing has been observed since um, I updated this slide this morning, but this is kind of a, a good a good snapshot of what, what y'all have been doing out here at Conesty. Um, on the ground, detecting, reporting, photographing. I mean, anytime, I, I encourage all of you, it's easy to download this app and get signed up to the Conesty Falls page and you just start taking pictures. There's algorithms in there that help you identify. It's a great way to contribute data to the community and learn yourself too. So um, last but not least, a couple recommendations. So in general, protect sensitive resources, prevent or mitigate degradation, control invasive species. And this last one I threw in there, I'm not trying to ruffle any feathers, but maybe reevaluate re relationships with wildlife um, and, and you know, perceptives, perceptions of wildlife. Um, things like discouraging new trail development in sensitive areas can help protect them. Um, promoting overall like a low intensity use. So, you know, maybe discouraging things like mountain biking, you know, on the trails and continuing to promote things like hiking and passive recreation getting people to places that are easily accessible rather than building new trails into places that aren't, that's a really good way of preventing degradation of an environment and still offering a good experience for people who wanna see natural features. Um, monitoring rare species occurrences and um, like buffering sensitive areas like the bog area or other parts of the property uh, by either restricting land, especially like in terms of the bog, you know, like preventing sediment from filling the bog in or acquiring parcels that might, uh, you know, really help steward that. So buffering a piece of land. Those are all strategies to help protect sensitive elements. Um, degradation and poaching. This is all about creating a culture of um, responsibility and accountability because everyone loves to see these plants and again, appreciate them for what they are, where they are and leave them where they are. So um, there was a potential, there was a potential poaching here. Actually, we first started iNaturalist and uh, a pink lady slipper disappeared from a known location. Don't know what happened, we, we're not exactly sure, but it quickly illustrated the need to back off um, and be very careful about how we share rare species information with people or charismatic species information. Um, discouraging things like, walking around in the streams too much or getting into the bog and stomping around or messing with crevices and rocks you know that's those are all disturbing activities to wildlife and plants that live there um we talked about redacting rare species information so iNaturalist does that automatically if a plant is listed or a species is listed it will put a uh, it'll obscure that record and so people can't get directly to it but obscuring or redacting information from public documents that can also be a good strategy and I threw this in there because it's interesting. Um, the U.S. Forest Service has countered the poaching of specifically of ginseng um, by applying chemicals to the roots in patches that are on protected land that are, are not allowed to be harvested. And, and so when someone harvests that plant illegally and takes it to sell, all it, all, it has to be passed under a UV light and it glows orange, bright orange. And so the purveyor knows this was harvested off of public land illegally. So that's just an example of a strategy that the feds have used to try and prevent people from taking from their property, which is vaster than this. Um, controlling non-native invasive plants, that's tr honestly a stewardship planning effort and something we can continue to talk about is maybe developing a plan or a strategy to approach invasive species, starting from the edges where they thrive, road, road edges, um, pathway edges, and working into the forest to prevent them from migrating further deeper into the forest. Um, being careful about what you do uh, if you're applying chemicals, being careful around sensitive areas, utilizing volunteers when at all possible. It's really good to help people learn about what they're doing and helps bring that connection to where, okay, I'm pulling this up for a good reason. And um, it helps establish like a, a sense of responsibility in people. And also, um, you know, things like a management plan, uh, I don't know if, if it's ever being considered to recommend uh, not planting certain species or recommend planting uh, native species over non-natives um, or 
like the city of uh, Asheville, and actually I think the state of North Carolina has just passed a bill to only use native plants on public projects. And so those are the types of cultural controls you can put in place that help promote the use of the selection of native plants or dis help discourage introducing invasive plants into a landscape that would then come into a natural area. And last but not least, I think I've probably run over my time based on your, your watch check, but I'm happy to answer some questions. But, uh, your, your talk was so interesting. I, 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 I figured that uh, people wouldn't mind uh, if we ran over for a few minutes. So, Owen, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. So uh, we have a microphone here. If anybody wants to uh, raise any questions for uh, for Owen, uh, you can always uh, grab him afterwards as well. I'm sure. But uh, if you have questions, please come on up and uh, and ask them. And and also, I'm through a quick exchange of my email with with Graham and, and you, if you want to get in touch with me outside of this public forum and ask a more specific question or ask about something specifically that could that I could ramble on for longer about, uh, feel free to reach out and get in touch with me. I mean, I've um, I've spent a lot of time out here and seen a lot of wonderful things. Uh, and I should say before I forget that the inventory report itself will be published later on today. It should be available on the, the CFPOA website. Oh, right. Well, I've got a really good, I've got a really good question for Owen, actually, because so so we get continual reports in, in Conestee Falls about the, the mountain lion and the cougar that, that exists mm. in, in Conestee Falls. So was that a picture of the uh, the, the mountain lion up there that you, you showed? No, no, <laughs> we did not. Uh, we did not get any pictures of mountain lions. And I will say there, this has been a a long-standing controversy for a while. And if you talk to professional biologists for the state, what they will tell you is what they are trained to tell you as a biologist is that they need information and evidence to, to prove that an individual was in a place where you saw it. A lot of times we see pictures shared around the internet. You can quickly Google reverse image search some of those and see that they came from a post on the Western United States or from the Southeastern United States. Um, but there are definitely verif verified reports of cougar, eastern cougar, in this area. The genetics are interesting. There's a mix of western cougar in a lot of those populations, and they're now starting to see uh, maybe evidence of genetic flow from the south, too. But we don't have dense populations of cougars. They're very clandestine. Think about, well, outside of this community, when you're hiking in Pisgah National Forest, think about how infrequently you see a bear. And we know a lot about the population of bears. There are lots of bears out, but you don't see them very often. So extrapolate that down to something that has a population density of maybe less than 100 in the state. And then it's kind of, you do the math and you realize, yeah, maybe you heard one caterwaul one time. Maybe you heard a scream in the middle of the night and it could have been one. Um, there certainly is a possibility, but their numbers are so low that running into one. Unlikely. Unlikely. Um, very unlikely. And, you know, many, many people have game cameras up all over this state trying to do just this. And um, there are very few images of them. So. Yes. And I'll repeat your question back to you. Are you exploring the impact of non-indigenous species that are migrating here, like armadillos? So she asked, am I exploring the impact of non-Indigenous species that are migrating here, such as armadillos? Um, this report did not consider, um, I think that's that, that question is probably a little bit higher level. Honestly, it could be something to bring into um, like future threat type type scenarios. I know that that uh, armadillos are around here. They've been seen up, uh, up and over the escarpment. They've been seen in Henderson County. I think I've seen reports of them in Transylvania County. I did not specifically talk about um, the the relationship, or, or I didn't specifically talk about armadillos as wildlife here. I will say too, the nuance in that, in the whole non-indigenous uh, adjective to describe them, uh, it depends on how far back you look in time. Like, you know, like about five to 10,000 years ago, 
relatives of armadillos, close relatives of current armadillos occupy this area. So it's almost like they're returning uh, back to an area that was once occupied that they left. And so, you know, there's, there's a, there's a deeper cycle to this migration. And so I'm not saying it's, it's where you draw the line with nativity, you know, and, and indigenousness, but um, they technically were occupied this, this part of the region in the past. And you can't say that about other creatures, some other creatures like rainbow trout or, you know, brown trout. They just didn't occur here ever. They were brought here and now, you know, they're here. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I can tell you that I did not speak at all about armadillos in, in my report. They do do structural damage though. What's an example of a rare non-vascular plant? Since I don't know. <laughs> so can the you, rare can you repeat the question? Yeah. So she said, what's an example of a rare non-vascular plant? Um, and so a, a great way of thinking about non-vascular plants is is essentially mosses. Mosses. Um, smaller. I don't want to say lesser plants, but less developed biologically, um, simpler organisms in some ways. But um, an example of a non-vascular plant would be something like hydrotheria. There's like a water fan lichen that occurs in spray cliff environments in the Carson Creek Gorge. Um, honestly, those rare non-vascular plants are best observed with a, a slicker on like right next to the water, right next to the waterfall with like a hand lens because they grow in those constantly wet spray influenced areas. And so, um, yeah. Jerry Overton, uh, I wondered if you had uh, researched and or come up with any recommendations to manage the deer population in mm. Conesty. So um, I, that was not a focus of this report was to develop recommendations on deer management. Um, I can tell you about some observations I've made incidental to my work. Um, there was a, well, there was a deer brow study done here many years ago. It was probably maybe 15 to 18 years ago. The Wildlife Resources Commission biologist came out and did some transects in the forest. And um, he found, honestly, what, what I found, which was that there is, there is deer browse in the natural forest here, um, but the deer do not appear to be causing a negative um, shift or a, a detrimental shift in vegetative communities. And so you don't see entire forests that are clear from head height, you know, to, to hoof height. You know, those, the, those are the types of things we're looking for, for like serious browse lines, cleared understory. And so from my, under, for, from my experience here, um, I did see a lot of deer and we captured a lot on camera. I saw the majority of them, of the does and younger deer near roads, um, near uh, properties, uh, developed residential properties, saw more bucks in the back country um, and larger individuals. But, you know, my role was not to um, interpret or make recommendations on what to do about the deer. Um, but I can tell you that they don't seem to be causing detrimental effects in the natural areas of Conestee Falls. That being said, I do know that they put pressure on everyone's landscape. Um, and they really like those $20 rhodo those $20 plants. They will eat rhododendrons too, obviously. You've seen that happen here, I'm sure. But um I don't have, I don't have um I did not draw any conclusions about what should be done about deer here. Just uh noted in my report that there there does not seem to be a significant browse line in the forest that is detrimental to the natural habitat. So um, probably doesn't answer your question as best as you'd want me to, but I will say um, the issue of deer is one that is in, important to lots of mountain communities around here, the struggle with the relationship with deer. That's why I put that in there. It's not, not telling you all to, to, you know, just let the deer eat your landscapes. And I'm not telling you to go hunt the deer. I'm not, I'm really not telling you to do anything with the deer at all, other than the fact that the natural habitat you have here is very supportive of them. Um, but, you know, I, uh, I realize it's contentious subject here and, um, it's probably something that will be continued to be explored in the future. Um, and I think it's, it's good to have those healthy discussions as a community about, you know, how to, um, manage wildlife in a community in a natural setting. Yes. One more question. Um, is it better 
could leave fallen trees in the woods? Or is it better to mitigate that because of the fire? Well, it's, it's you, pretty. Could, uh, Alan, could you repeat the question? Yes. Um, so the question was uh, Is it better to leave downed trees on the ground? Um, or is it better to mitigate them or mitigate the potential wildfire, fire, wildfire risk that those downed trees represent? So leave the tree when it falls or remove the tree is, is the basis of this question, right? So um, <laughs> as a botanist, my definition of tree comes into play um, because, you know, anything above like eight inches diameter um, is not, unless it's been sitting on the ground in a very dry location for years, that, that does not represent fuel the way that pine needles do or the way that uh, a dense layer of uh, leaf litter does and so, or that a, a patch of mountain laurel that got bored and died and fell over into a, you know, a real thick mass. And those th last three examples represent things that are fire ready fuels, a tree on the ground, um, very rarely, even in, in landscapes where they've enacted controlled burns or, or I've been in post wildfire landscapes, like in Linville Gorge and things, very rarely do you see those trees fully igniting or becoming like a ladder. So, and I'm saying like, tree you know saplings small you know seedling sapling trees if they fell um the they have a the fire can more uh fully encompass their stems and so it 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 the fire eats it better and so a large tree on the ground sometimes can act as a fire block um so fire is moving through uh, leaves in the woods and it hits a large oak tree 18 inch diameter oak tree that fell 15 years ago, that tree is very rarely is that tree going to ignite. Now, the problem is when you have a tree that has partially fallen and is hung up like a snag. So it's a tree that is fallen. So it has surface area under it. It's not touching the ground. When the fire can get under it and get around it, it more easily consumes that tree. And so I would say as an ecologist, if you're asking my personal opinion, leave the, leave the down, a downed tree on the ground because Absent the fire risk, that down tree represents an incredible habitat for all sorts of organisms, ground dwelling insects, rodents, pileated woodpeckers, bears, you know, they all come to those places to find a home or forage or feed or hide. And so, um, you know, that's when I find a log that I can lift up in the ground, I'm oftentimes peeling it back to see what's under it or looking in the looking in the hollow to see what's what's in it you know or is it does it represent habitat so as my my ecologist the ecologist to me says you know leave the trees on the ground if you have a tree that's hung and uh, you know and it's on your private property cut it up and take it out of uh, you know off the ground or you could carefully notch it and let that tree fall out of the ground and let it be habitat. Maybe watch it for a year and see what happens. Maybe this ecosystem will develop around it and you can connect with it and become closer with it. It might not be the right habitat. It might just sit there and be a log on the ground. And if you, a year later, you, you look at it and it, it's not inspiring, you know, remove it. But in the natural areas of the property, um, I would say, you know, when a tree falls, it just stays. So, yes. I took a picture a couple of years ago of what ended up being, people told me it was an arrowhead worm. Mm. And, um, since it's so late, would something like that be helpful to the iNaturalist? Absolutely. Um, yeah, so she used the example of a picture of a hammerhead worm, a non-native uh, worm that, uh, or a non-native planarian that has moved around in the landscape and horticulture industry um, and is now in our natural systems or right on the periphery of our natural systems. So she was saying um, she got a picture of one from a friend living in here. Would that be useful to share on iNaturalist? And the, the short answer is yes. Regardless of the age of the photograph, I mean, we could put a cap on maybe a decade or something like that. But regardless of the age of the photograph, if you can get it into iNaturalist and you can accurately portray where the photograph was taken, that's the most important information. So, you know, a couple of years late, that's fine. It's now in the inventory. And so um, it's a it's a good piece of data. The worst data is the data that doesn't exist.
That was actually a picture I took uh, oh. years ago, but then people said that we should put salt on it. Is that correct? You can you can kill them with salt. Yes, you should not cut them. Uh, you can't cut their head off. They'll just grow into two. And so, yeah, you can kill them with salt. Definitely. Yeah. Yes. Did your study find a lot of invasive plants that there should be some effort to remove? That's a great question. The question was, did my study find a bunch of invasive plants that need to be removed? Um, I think the, I think the. Um, the straightforward answer is you have a lot of roads in here and most of the invasive species that I found here originate along the side of the road and radiate into the natural forest from points that enter the natural forest. And so it's, it's called the edge effect. And so um, I'd say that it's typical practice along roadside management to use non-native species for slope st stability. And those species like Lespedezas, there's a couple of different species of non-native Lespedezas that are ubiquitous along the roadsides here. And they're, but they're ubiquitous along the roadsides on 64 because the DOT, well, just last year stopped planting them, but they've been planting those species for years and recommending them in manuals. And so that's an unfortunate um, situation right there. But for other plants like um, Japanese spirea, uh, multiflora rose, um, those plants, those, again, well, the first one, Japanese spirea, um, not a huge problem, but it moves readily from landscapes. And so a lot of other natural areas that are invaded by that species, it starts in a homeowner's landscape and it goes from there. And once it gets a hold, it gets really challenging to stop. Um, but there, there are not large contiguous infestations uh, outside of the road corridor, which is one large contiguous area, depending on how you look at it. So really the most important thing that I think you could do in a non-native invasive plant management strategy would be to identify those sources um, and try to work on reducing the edge effect. So stopping invasives from moving from those corridors. And it could also be something cultural, like talking to the road management company and requesting that they use native seeds, you know? Um, so you do have invasives here. They're mainly along corridors. And um, I found find them in less frequently in the deepest natural areas, but they, and they, they start to fade in strength from the road into the forest. So I think you know, an important thing to do would be stop the movement from trails that go from roads into deep natural areas. Um, and then try to work on those roadsides methodically to reduce the chance of invasion from that area. Yeah, let me just say one word about invasive species. We have uh, discussed this several times in the Natural uh, Resources Committee, and our plan is to have a, an initiative and try and get some volunteers to come along and help us deal with some of the invasive species. So if you look out for the Friday flyer or the, the monthly newsletter, there will be some opportunities to volunteer to, to go out and help control some of those species. And, and another point to add on to that, iNaturalist isn't just for native species, it's for all species. And so if someone here has a penchant to um, try and map invasive species, you could use iNaturalist to do that as well. And so um, that could be a really important way of documenting you know, at trailheads, you know, it'd be a great place to establish an, a quick inventory of invasive plants you see there, because those are likely going to be the plants you see farther in the forest down the road. Um, so there, there could be some synthesis there. Friday flyer, here's a species to be on the lookout for. Maybe it's timed with the flowering phenology, so you can really recognize it when you drive by it. And then you have a tool to just mark a point real quick and go on, go about your day. So was there one more question? I think we'll take this as the last question. Okay, the question was, I might have missed the verb. What is the opinion on the trapping of native mammal species for the convenience of people? essentially. So, and then the right. example was... Yeah. Let me give you just a little bit of a background, yeah. there, a little bit of a loaded question there. <laughs> we, we, um, we um, uh, in the past year, we've had uh, beavers in the uh, community and uh, also an otter as well. 
And I think the question relates to how we deal with, with those. And Jim's not here at the moment. I think he just left. But uh, the, uh, um, that has been dealt with as an operational issue in, in up until now. But um, so it's really been under Jim Whitmore's jurisdiction as to what to do with uh, the beavers and the and the otters. But I think we would certainly very be interested in your your opinions. Yeah, um, well, being a human myself, you know, I've never had to deal with a nuisance otter or a nuisance beaver, except I will say, and there is some transition or some some uh, crossover with other parts of my pro professional world. We we build stream and wetland restoration projects, Equinox does, and um, the state does not want beavers in those restoration projects. They want to be able to, for you to delineate the, the sinuosity of the stream every year for seven years, and you don't want a beaver damming your stream up and and flooding it because then you can't do those measurements so there there we are faced directly with that crisis as managers of a restoration project we recognize that beavers built a lot of our landscapes i mean a lot of the the way that our floodplains were formed over time and that you can't see anymore because of what we've done to them most of our landscapes in the eastern united states and even some in the western united states maybe even more so are highly beaver influenced and so here i am an ecologist knowing that beavers built the ecosystem that i'm trying to rebuild after a human destroyed it and i'm also now have to get the beaver out of it it's an interesting juxtaposition so i do i do understand the dilemma there um we also I'll give you another kind of reference story, and maybe this will lead into a, a concluding statement because it's hard for me to make one here. But um, we helped uh, the community of Lonesome Valley uh, write a land management plan um, that helps them manage all their built environments, their natural areas, including their trout farm, which is plagued by otters. And um, they also have beavers on the property. But I mean, they have. They've had to trap otters and prevent them from eating the non-native trout that are put into the built pond for the people to fish out, you know, so there's a lots of like really, really um, challenging dichotomy associated with these. And I think, you know, if the reason, yeah, I think you need to really think about the impact and, and what the beaver is doing and, or what the otter is doing to impact the resource that you're trying to protect when you trap it. And for the community of Lonesome Valley, it was their decision to continue to do that because that pond represented a resource that was vital to their community. And I understand that. They, that pond was built way before I was even thought about, you know, so I understand that aspect of it. Um, but, you know, for, for a community like Conesty, I would put the charge back and say, well, and Jim has probably done this, obviously, but, you know, what is the resource that we're trying to manage and is the action that we're proposing to take, is this thing threatening the resource such that we need to remove it? Is it causing an imbalance? You know, is it uh, just eating the fish that we stock, you know, which is a cost, you know, if you pay HOA fees to, and then part of that is to stock the lakes, I'm sure. So that's a rambling answer, but um, I, I would have trouble, I don't have trouble calling a APHIS to come trap beavers out of my site, but I have a hard time when I visit a restoration site and find a beaver that has been killed by a conibear trap, you know, sitting there. So again, not a, not the best answer to your question, but really some thoughts for, for y'all to consider as a community. Um, and, you know, it's again, stewardship planning, priorities, community planning, all those things are wrapped into that little ecological conflict, so. Uh, thank you for your, for, for your question. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. And I'd just like to say thanks so much for your time. I know I went way over, but it seems like y'all were really engaged and interested. And um, I think that what we produced for the stewardship committee is really going to help this community um, move forward in a direction that reflects kind of like the rebranding of the community now. It's like living in harmony with the mountains here, so.
So go go read the inventory report, and uh, there'll be an examination on it tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs>